I'm the site manager for the site, so the site is, is my responsibility to ensure that it runs effectively and is compliant. I got a phone call about quarter to five or five o'clock saying that there'd been a, a loss of power, electrical power to the whole site. We weren't unable to get the power back on. And I got down there about kind of six o'clock and I went to try and ascertain what the problem was on site, why we didn't have any electricity. And it turned out to be a, a f an electrical fault on the high voltage power to the site. When I got to site, one of the construction contractors was already dealing with the electrical problems and dealing with Scottish and Southern and um, arranging the repair. I kind of went and had a look at the site to see what we needed to do to keep it compliant, to keep it running. Around about this stage, one of my colleagues actually has, has got an office on the site and he was still at work. So I was speaking to him because a number of years ago he'd been the manager for that site. The immediate thoughts that were coming into my mind were site compliance. Um, how could we maintain the site in compliance if we were not able to get power to the site? And then there's the, the peripheral catchment issues with pumping stations continually pumping into the site and basically you can't stop it. Another principal concern was the fact that I knew that the Environment Agency put us under a great deal of pressure on that site too because of previous problems and the fact that we discharge into a very sensitive river. So then the section leader said, OK, can we turn off the pumping stations outside to stop the flow coming into the site to help us maintain compliance? And my reply was basically, no, there is no capacity in the catchment to be able to switch the stations off. Therefore, you'll have to live with flow coming into the, into the site. As time progressed, it looked like the uh, power was going to be off for a number of hours. Um, I'd spoken to the process scientist about the site and it became apparent that we couldn't afford for the electricity to be off an hour, let alone the six to nine hours that we were quoted for this repair to be done. And even then it wasn't guaranteed that the, the electricity would be back on. I, I very quickly started to work out what we needed to run and what we needed to do as a minimum to keep the site up and running and I discussed that with some of the operational staff and, and the, the other section leader who was on the site we had a talk amongst ourselves about what we really needed to run and one aspect that, that we desperately desperately needed to run were the rectangular filters. So we started to look at the options as to how we could power the rectangular filters. The only way was to get some form of power supply to the principal part of the site which was the rectangular filters. Um, because the rest of the site being gravity, the, the flow would just keep passing through. So we discussed the options, which were there is a mobile generator on the site, a 60 kVA generator in one of the sheds. Is there any option to connect that up into the panel directly just to maintain that one piece of plant on the site, which would basically keep you in consent because 70% of the flow passes through that site, that part of the works. And the Southern Water electrician was asked, is it possible to connect a generator up directly to the panel to maintain the, the plant operational? To which the answer was, yes, in theory, it is possible. We have enough power supply. I was called out by an operator who'd been called to uh, chicken oil treatment works. Uh, there was a power cut. When I arrived on site, a lot of other things had failed. We went and checked the site. It was decided because it was going to be a long-term power cut, we try and keep the site in consent by hardwiring a generator onto the rectangular filters. There's no generator socket directly on the rectangular filters, so I had to take the, the plug end of the cable to pieces and put terminal lugs on, on the ends so it could be connected directly onto the supply for the rectangular filters. Unfortunately, I wasn't too familiar with the site so I had to find the point of isolation before I started, which I didn't find. Having spoken to the contractors on the site, we were assured that the power would be switched off at the HV point so there would be no power to the site. I recognised it was probably going to take about an hour to actually connect the generator up to the plant. It would probably take another hour to disconnect it. But that was, that was a compliance risk I was willing to take in order for everybody to be safe. The operational section leader went back to the Southern Water contractor who was liaising with the electricity supplier who was making the repair, clarifying that the power supply could not possibly 
take place until everybody was clear of the panels and that the power supply would not be turned on until a head count was done and all staff were accounted for. I spoke to the contractor again and we went over it that we would do a head count. Once everyone was there, I knew exactly the number of Southern Water staff that we had on site. I knew where they were, I knew what they were doing. Um, and the agreement was before the power was turned back on, I would have my operational team who were working on the site in one place and then the power would be turned back on. I stripped the cable, did everything the right way around. I did the, did the cable on the generator, plugged that in, made sure the generator worked and I had power on the plug. I went upstairs and in the panel, I disconnected the current lugs, so I checked they were dead, which I knew they would be, there was no power on site. Disconnected those tails and pulled them away. I wasn't happy. I had the managers holding uh, the torches in front of me. I tested the tails before I disconnected them, and one of them asked me, is it, is it dead? And I said, yes, but it doesn't matter because they can turn the power on at any point. He began the process of, of, of wiring it in. He was just about to uh, put the first wire or phase, I believe. Stop! He must have been centimetres from connecting the wire to it when we heard someone shouting from the, the bottom of the stairs telling everyone to stop. We were all stood there with torches in complete darkness and at that point there was a voice that came from outside the building stating, shouting, do not touch any of the panel, everything has just gone live again. I was standing beside Kevin, as was the, the other manager on the site, holding torches, you know, about a foot away from the panel. And I think everybody just stood back, immediately knowing that what potentially could have happened. There, there was just a silence and everybody just looked at each other. I think the overwhelming drive was to keep the site running and to keep it compliant. I can remember vividly three separate occasions what we were going to do to keep everybody safe. Now I look back at it in hindsight and I look at the plan jobs we do and the amount of planning that we do. And I think that was something that was probably lacking on, on my part. I should have created a written procedure. We communicated regularly with the guys that were doing it. There just seemed to be a complete breakdown between what we'd agreed 20 minutes, half an hour beforehand. I was told afterwards that being the skilled electrician working and the only skilled electrician working on the equipment, I had the power to, to say no. I, I, should have, I should have known better, but as I say at the time, it was uh, inexperience from myself and uh, the, the, the pressure of the job, sort of overriding factors that just easy to get carried away. I was a manager on the site. I was the chap who was driving the programme forward. We were trying to get the site back up and running. We were trying to get it up together and you know, potentially because of those actions or because of what we were trying to achieve, there was, a, there was a chance that, you know, one or more of us could have been seriously injured or worse. And that was something I felt very responsible for. I think that decisions kind of made in, in real time are, are rarely perfect. I think, you know, the intentions were right, what we were trying to do. I think the intentions from the health and safety were, were right. But in the end of the day, it wasn't as it should have been. It was a wake-up call. I think if a lot of people are going to watch this DVD, they'll see what happened to someone else. I don't think it's ever until it happens to you that you will really take notice and, and make changes. Not that I was doing much wrong in the first place, but I'll just double-check everything now. I'll just do it by the book, following health and safety, electrical regulations, all the relevant things. I think something I've really taken away from it is that regardless of how urgent you think it is or regardless of how 
important at the time you think it is from, from a compliance point of view or from a process point of view, the most important thing is to ensure that everybody's safe. And I think that actually, had we perhaps sat down for 10 minutes and written a procedure out and agreed what we needed to do, then I wouldn't be sitting here having this discussion now. And I think that extra 10 minutes in the bigger scheme of things and in the bigger picture would have made no difference to the compliance, but potentially could have saved somebody's life.